getting more comfortable with gray water. So I'm going to go ahead and get started and again welcome you all for joining us today for the gray water concepts and considerations webinar. Um, it's really lovely that we're able to transition to this online platform and of course to have all of you here with us today. And I do want to make mention that um, we are very appreciative to be sponsored by the city of Katati who allow us to be here today and uh, supporting all of you through this experience and education process and again allowing us to actually offer online webinars for free. All right, again, hello. My name is Liz and I am a Senior Programs Coordinator with Daily Acts. We're also joined my, by my phenomenal colleague, Connor, who was the individual in the background who really solved that issue with the chat. Um, Connor, if you wanna say hello, then people will have the opportunity to see your screen. Hello everyone, so excited to see you here and I'm excited to learn from Laura alongside you. Fantastic, myself as well. And uh, already what I'm seeing from the chat is that we have people joining us from all over, which is truly phenomenal. Thank you again so, so much for being here. And I do anticipate with so many people joining us from all around um, that maybe a number of you have not actually heard of Daily Act. So I do want to take a moment to describe our small and, and mighty nonprofit. Daily Acts is a holistic education nonprofit that takes a heart-centered approach to inspiring transformative actions that create connected, equitable, and climate resilient communities. We firmly believe in the power of our daily actions to reconnect people to self, community, and place, which helps to heal our society and planet. Our holistic approach starts in the soil and swells into culture and policy change. Through over 100 talks, tours, and trainings a year, we implement three interwoven strategies for systems change. First, we spread solutions and models that offer the skills, tools, and resources to grow food, medicine, habitat, and community, all while conserving resources. Next, we strengthen community leadership by connecting leaders who understand the interrelations of social, economic, and environmental justice issues through networks and alliances. And lastly, we are working to build public and political will by mobilizing, <clears throat> excuse me, by mobilizing our community's power for environmental and climate justice policies. As you can tell, our impacts are far and wide, and we really, really do believe that we all have the ability to be the change that we wish to see in the world. And again, I want to thank you all for joining us because I do firmly believe that by being here today, you all want to be the change that you, can, you wish to see in the world. And I hope that you leave today's webinar with some new from knowledge, and especially I hope that you go home to your friends, your families, your community, and you share that knowledge with everybody. Before we dive in, I do wanna go over a few housekeeping items, which I think you all have already um, experienced. We do have the Q&A portion that should be at the bottom of your screen. We will take some time throughout this webinar to answer all of your questions, and I certainly encourage you all to come into this webinar with your questions and curiosity. So throughout the presentation, please feel free to submit questions to that Q&A portion that you see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, I will answer whatever I can via the chat in the Q&A section. Um, but again, we will take the time to answer your questions out loud. We will also be sending follow-up resources and a thank you email to everybody who is here joining us. So if for some reason we are not answer, able to answer a question in great detail, we'll be sure to follow up with more information. Without any further ado, I would like to introduce Laura Allen, who is the co-founder of Greywater Action, and she has also spent the last 20 years exploring low-tech sustainable water solutions. In addition to that, she has authored the Waterwise Home, How to Conserve and Reuse Water in Your Home and Landscape in Grey Water, as well as Green Landscape. Laura is an amazing educator and she leads classes and workshops on rainwater harvesting, grey water reuse, and composting toilets, and also works on policies and codes for water reuse, water reuse systems in the West. So Laura, thank you so much for being here. We are so appreciative. And just like Connor said, I'm very eager to learn alongside you. So without any further ado, I'm going to stop my screen share and allow you to take over from here. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, Liz. I am excited to be here. Um, Daily Act is one of my favorite organizations. That's one of the things that I miss from being in the Bay Area is being closer to Daily Acts and all the amazing programs and just everything that you guys are doing. So I'm super happy to be here, even though we're remote. Um, 
Thanks everyone for joining. My name's Laura and I'm gonna get started. Um, Liz, do you think enough about me? Um, so we're gonna talk about gray water concepts and considerations. And again, if you have questions, feel, feel free to add them in and I'll try to make sure we get to all your questions. For most of us, when we turn on the tap, water comes out. It's almost like magic. Uh, comes out seemingly limitless and it's typically very clean. And we often forget, though we should, not, should never forget, that if we weren't using that water, it would have been in a natural place somewhere. It might have been in a river, a creek, it could have been in the groundwater, and then later coming out through a spring or seeping into a, a natural system. And that water sustains other living things. And so by being mindful of our own water, we're also being mindful of the water for all, everything. Um, it, gray water is one of my favorite topics because it brings in all of these other questions that are really important, like how much water are we using? And so I just want you to think for a minute, how much water do you use every day? Like how many gallons? And if you don't know, then that's a great time to, to find out. And if you do know, good job, because most people don't. It turns out that Americans use more water than anyone per capita on average. Of course, huge variations among Americans and every, every person every in the world. Um, but we are on the top of the water use, and that's really not a good thing. Um, we use about 150 gallons per person per day. And if you see this chart in the middle, you can see a lot of European countries, which have a very similar standard of living, use about half as much as we do. And so this is the question of, you know, why? Why do we use so much more? And our landscapes are really the biggest, um, the biggest reason for that. We're growing landscapes that need a lot of water. And then, so we use our water, it goes down the drain. And for many people, that's kind of the end of the story. It's away and they don't think about it anymore. And I bet a lot of people on this webinar have some inkling of where their water goes when it goes down the drain. Or if you don't, now's a great time to investigate that. Um, and basically we can't really be uh, using water the way we've been, forgetting where it goes, not really thinking about how much we use. This is the drought monitor from just a couple days ago. You can see California is in drought, different stages across the state. And I'm sure that you all remember not so many years ago, there was a very severe drought and we know that drought is a normal situation for the West. And it's not just California, it's everywhere. You can see all of the red on the whole country. This is the water supply index, risk index. So we have risky water supplies all across the country, especially in the West. So this is a great time to figure out other ways to use our water. It turns out we use about half of the water inside our home and half of the water outside our home in our landscapes. And our landscapes don't need the same quality of water as we do. And so I just want to introduce two concepts for purpose and the right water for the job. So it's really important as we move forward with our water that we're using the right water for the job. And for irrigating landscapes, we don't need to be using drinking water anymore. Gray water is not the only supply. I'm just going to to a super brief overview of these other supplies. In a single family home, we have rainwater options and Daily X does lots of education around other waters. We have storm water, we have gray water, which I'm gonna talk about tonight. We have black water, which is all the combined wastewater, though regulations don't typically allow that for reuse in California. And there's also mechanical water, air conditioning condensate water in some situations. So as we move forward, we can really think, do we want to be on the left. Brown is the new green, just thinking of these sparse landscapes. They aren't using very much water, um, but is not really creating life or food or habitat. Or do we want to be on the other side where we can grow productive landscapes that have they use very little, if none, no potable water. And so today we're going to talk about the right side of that screen, having these lush, beautiful landscapes and how to do that with your residential gray water. So I'm going to do a brief overview talk about some popular systems, go over some calculations. This is an overview presentation, so there's a lot more to know if you're really gonna be building and installing a system, but you'll have a good idea of what you need to know as you move forward. I'll bring weave in regulations throughout the talk and then talk about strategies for beneficial reuse. And there's gonna be a couple of polls, so if you wouldn't mind um, just letting us know why you're here. Why would you, why, why are you participating in the webinar? Are you just generally interested? Are you wanting to do this for your own home? Are you a renter interested in gray water? Or maybe you wanna offer the service professionally. Maybe you're a regulator and you need to know about gray water to regulate it. And maybe there's other reasons too. Yeah, for any of those others, uh, go ahead and submit your other into the chat. And Liz, can they see the poll right now? 
Okay. Right now only I can see it, but once we end it momentarily, I'll go ahead and launch those responses so everybody can see it. And I do want to mention that all of the polls are also anonymous. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to end this poll in about five seconds. Looks like we have 90, 95% of people have voted. That's pretty good. You guys are quick. Yeah. All right, I'm ending it now. So we have a lot of homeowners interested in gray water, a lot of general interest, and then some renters and some trades people. Great. Can, they can see that. Yeah, I minimized okay. it, so hopefully they cannot see it anymore. I have not done polls yet. This is my first time doing polls for with Zoom, so. Okay, so we're gonna go on. Do you, can you make that come off of the screen? Do you still see the poll? I still see the poll, yeah. You should be able to exit. Do you have that option? Oh, okay. I think I have to. Sorry, everybody. Just a little glitch. I can't see my mouse when I'm playing the presentation. Okay, there we go. <laughs> there are really large-scale opportunities with gray water reuse. San Francisco, just across um, the, not too far from you guys, it, and for the people in uh, Petaluma, is a uh, a great example of these really large scale systems where they're using building scale gray water as well as other supplies for toilet flushing and irrigation. And in Los Angeles, there's also some examples of these really large scale systems. These are very different, um, the same concept, reusing water, but the actual technologies are quite different than the systems that I'm going to talk about tonight. But I want you to know that this is happening at all the different scales. And our homes are a great place to start. And also to keep in mind, gray water, when we're thinking about this in the big picture, gray water costs a lot less than most other water supplies, or it costs less than many other water supplies. And this was done looking at Southern California. And you can see that gray water recycling was uh, cost less than a lot of the existing supplies, excuse me, than a lot of the alternate supplies. And it's really comparable to water like the Los Angeles aqueduct water, which is where Los Angeles buys its water from. So it's a great supply, a great option. And one important question is how much water can you save? And that really depends on so many factors. But to give you a general idea, in California, we have about a billion gallons of gray water every day. And if anyone thinks, oh, we could save a billion gallons, that's not, probably not, because we can't access a lot of that water. But the, there, is, there is a lot of potential to get water. When we zoom down to our household scale, there's about 16 to 40%. Um, 16 to 40% of reduction possibility. And Liz, the poll just popped back up on my screen. Is that there for everybody? Hmm. Uh, I'm not seeing it on my screen, but if anybody else is seeing it on theirs. Okay, somebody says not on my screen. Appreciate that. Fine. Okay, I'll try to ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> if you can drag it off of your screen. Yes, somebody writes, I had to hit close. I did. Okay, sorry guys, I, it is quite distracting. I can't drag it off. Sure. There we go. Okay, so in a, at your household scale, you can see about 16 to 40% reduction. And the reason that range is so big is because you can't always access all of your gray water. You can see in this picture, there's different systems coming off of different fixtures in the home and they're all working together to save water. But in some homes, you can't access all the showers nor all the washing machines, nor are there all the sinks and the amount of landscape varies and the amount of water in the home varies. So there's, there's a lot of factors. Um, but to save any water at all, the system has to be properly designed. So I really encourage you to take some time and be thoughtful around the design side of your systems so you can make sure that you're saving as much water. Um, that chart that I'm showing you on the, the left, the average monthly water use, this was from a study we did in the area looking at gray water systems that had gray water systems from before they had them and after and looking at their water bills to see if it affected their water consumption. And as you can see, the gray line is the line after their gray water system was installed and the homes on average went down. Um, the per capita savings was 17 gallons per day and that was a 26% per capita reduction. There was a big range, but that's what we saw on average. Um, there's, it's definitely possible to design a very um, technically accurate water system and not save any water at all because the designer wasn't thinking about saving water. This picture on the right, this is in Long Beach, and they put in a gray water system in a lawn and they weren't thinking about, you know, how can we reduce the amount of water we're watering this landscape. They put their 
new fruit trees in their little basins right in the middle of the lawn. And you can imagine that to keep that lawn green, which it is, this is Southern California, they had to keep watering it with a sprinkler system. So they designed a system though, nothing was really wrong with it, except that they kept watering the same as they were watering before. So they weren't saving water. So that's something that you can avoid if you think about it. It's not hard. So getting to the basics of gray water, like what is it? The first uh, source of gray water, which is typically the easiest to access, is from your washing machines. If you have a top loading machine, you're looking at about 30 to 50 gallons per load. If you have a front loading machine, about 12 to 25. Some of the new really efficient front loaders are even less than 12. They're about, well, 12, maybe 11, 10 gallons. It can be quite efficient. And then there's those pop efficient machines and those are 15 to 25 gallons a load. So knowing your kind of machine, uh, knowing how many loads of laundry you do per week, you can multiply and get the quantity you have from your washer. Showers and baths are another source of gray water. And sinks are too. Um, bathroom sinks are considered gray water. Kitchen sink under current regulations in California is not considered gray water. It is in Oregon. Um, so in California, it's more difficult to reuse legally. And I could go a long explanation of why, but it's a little bit of a tangent, so we'll skip that. Gray water is never from toilets. There's a lot of benefits. The water savings usually is the driver for gray water systems, though you also now have an automatic irrigation system. So if you were hand watering, now it's automatic. So you save time, you save energy. Um, there's some kind of community benefits like the energy savings, because now you're not have to have treated uh, pressurized water that you that took a lot of energy to create going out to your landscape. It also really connects us to our landscapes. For many people, it's the first time they thought about, well, what am I putting in the water? Because now it's going into my tree. So they uh, are more, it builds a lot of awareness. And there's probably lots of other benefits you could think of. If we were in person, then could get a little bit more input. But since we're on a webinar, we can just think about it in our own homes. And so is gray water legal? Yes, it's legal. It's been legal for a while. Um, it's regulated in California in Chapter 15 of the California Plumbing Code. Some systems don't require permits, others do, um, but th this is where you'll find the regulation. In some areas, it's easier to get a, a system permitted than others, even though it is at the state, uh, been legalized for many years. So how can you use it? The first way, which is the way I'm going to, the, the method I'm going to focus on tonight is for outdoor irrigation. But it can only be used for non-potable needs inside the home the, or the building, like to flush toilets. But to get gray water, which has lint and hair and dirt and soap and, and it grows bacteria, um, to get that to come back into your home and be able to be in a toilet tank sitting around and be clean enough to not cause odor problems or cause problems with the, the flapper and the flushing mechanisms, it has to be quite clean. So a system to, that filters that water, disinfects it, takes a lot of maintenance and is quite costly for it to work well. So toilet flushing systems are great at the larger scale where there is um, the, the resources to really invest in a high maintenance and higher cost system. At the residential level, um, I've rarely seen it. I wouldn't say, I mean, it, it's possible, but I've rarely seen it being the best choice for the amount of water saved and for the resources that go into it, but it is possible. Another option, if you really just can't stand the thought of flushing with potable water, which is pretty offensive, um, is these little hand washing sinks that go on the top of your tank. The sink positive is a retrofit. You, it's a not too expensive and it just, you take off your old tank, you, the old lid to your tank, you put that on and you connect the water line. So this is potable fill water that's filling your toilet. So instead of just filling the tank, it goes through a little faucet so you can wash your hands after you flush the toilet. I kind of like that. It's just very simple. Um, and it raises some water. You can also uh, purchase a whole toilet that's all integrated, which is a bit more pricey, but it also works. So we're going to now focus on the outside use of gray water. And so with when you're use, putting that water into your landscape, it really matters what you put on the drain. The quality of gray water varies completely based on what you are using in your home. So I want you to use what we call plant-friendly products. These are products that are good for your plants, or at least not going to hurt your plants. They don't contain very much salt, so they're very low in salt. They don't contain boron, and they don't contain chlorine. Um, salt and boron are not harmful to us, so you can buy what's called a, you know, ecological product. It can have lots of salt and lots of boron, and it's fine if you're going to discharge into the ocean, but to go into your landscape, that's something that's not going to be good for your plants. So it's sort of a, a unique way to look at the product. 
because it's for your plants. There's a lot of examples. You don't have to necessarily go to a special store. Um, any major grocery store probably carries one of these brands. Any health food store definitely does. Costco usually has um, an option that really, it's not hard. You just have to know what you're looking for. So this list is available and you are gonna get this presentation. I, or no, are you gonna get this presentation? Sorry. And yeah, we'll also, be doing a recording. Okay, which we have as a resource has all of this listed. So you don't need to write these down fast or remember this. Um, when you look at the showers, the products in your showers are usually, they usually don't contain salt or boron, so they're much less of an issue, or they contain very little salt. The powdered laundry detergents, that's the really bad stuff for your, your plants. So in the showers, it's much less crucial um, to like buy a specific thing, um, but you do want to be aware, like you don't want to bleach your hair, or dye, hair dye, things that are pretty harsh or harsh cleaners, you don't want that to go out into your landscape. And then the last thing is sodium-based water softened water is not suitable for your plants. So if you have a sodium-based water softener, then that can't be used for gray water. And then a couple other general considerations. Gray water is not potable. And this sounds really obvious, but it's quite different for most of us. You turn on the hose, that's potable water coming out. It's the same water that you drink from the tap in your kitchen. And gray water is not potable. So you don't want people to contact it. You wanna make sure that it's soaking into the ground and not being able to be accessed by others. So these are health, human health considerations as well as environmental health. So you don't want it to pool up. This would be an access point. It also could breed mosquitoes. You don't wanna create vector issues. You don't want people to have direct contact with the water and you don't want it to run off. This is environmental health consideration. Gray water contains nutrients, which putting in your garden is great. Nutrients are like plant food, but if you put nutrients into a creek or a aquatic system that causes algae to grow and that's a source of pollution. So you need to stay on your property. The, the code has setbacks that are kind of designed to keep you away to, to not cause any of these problems, but it's important to understand the why. Like why shouldn't you be too close to a creek or why shouldn't it get into the storm drain? Um, and then the last one is no root vegetables. And that's a code requirement because you don't want to eat, you don't want to ingest gray water. So the thought is if you are putting gray water onto your carrot, you pick the carrot, you don't wash the carrot, then you eat the carrot, you've eaten gray water, which you would not want to do. Um, it's really easy to just water something else. So there's no need to just, well, people always want to know well, why can't I water root vegetables? You know, could I do it somehow? And you know, of course there's a way to do everything, but it's just, there's so many other things you could water. So you don't water the root vegetables. So a couple of other kind of general things you need to know before we talk about systems are something called mulch. I'm sure you've all seen this. It's great for um, keeping down weeds, keeping moisture in the soil, and it's also used as a filter in gray water, in simple gray water systems. It actually filters the gray water, absorbs it, soaks it up, and then it lets it soak into the soil. So we use a lot of wood chips in gray water systems. We build what's called a mulch basin. So you're digging, removing soil, so you're creating a basin near the plants that you want to water and filling that up with wood chips. And that spreads out the gray water so it goes over a larger root area of the plant. It provides surge capacity, prevents pooling and runoff. It's really this great, um, I don't even know what to call it. It's not, it's a component of the system and it's important and really easy to, to build. And then as it breaks down, you get great um, soil. And there's also something you wanna use called a diverter valve. So this allows you to control the flow of water. Let's say you want to bleach your hair or you want to use a product that you or need to, or for whatever reason, that's not gonna be good for your garden. All you have to do is turn the handle of a valve and that will send the water back to where it went before. So there's always a way to send the water back to the sewer or the septic system. There's different valves based on what kind of system you're installing, but the concept is the same. You can redirect the flow either to your gray water or back to the sewer or septic. Before I talk about systems, I can't leave out the bucket. Um, I bet some of you here are people that collect your cold water before it turns into the shower, the warm shower water in a bucket and use that. Um, there's lots of just really little things you can do. You can get a bucket for probably, you could probably find one or buy one for a couple of dollars and you can save a lot of water that way. It's not a system because it takes you actually moving the water, but it's a great way to remember um, how heavy water is. And it's a great way to make you appreciate your gray water system that will now do all this for you and send it out to your landscape. Gray water systems can be very simple. 
if you look at the picture on the left, there is the sink. There's a pipe coming out of the sink. It's draining into a basin and there's a plant by it. Probably many of you could just build that right now by looking at that picture. It's very simple. Um, on the right, this is also a gray water system. It has multiple, you, if you run out of gray water, the system can pull in other water supplies. Um, it can pull in rainwater. If there's a rainwater system, it can pull in municipal water. It's monitoring how much water is being used. It can tell you on your smartphone. Uh, it's filtered so the gray water can go to a drip irrigation system. So it's very sophisticated or high tech. And that's also a gray water system. So some kind of some challenges around gray water are what are you when you say I want a gray water system, like what do you what are you talking about? The requirements for a permit are really different based on what kind of system you're installing, the cost, the complexity, the what could go wrong um, is really different. So we're going to start out by talking about simple systems. They are great because they're simple, less to break, um, less cost, but they're limited. They are really good for irrigating your larger plants. So if you have trees you want to water, bushes, vines, larger annuals and perennials, pretty much like a plant the size of a tomato plant or larger, that is great for a simple gray water system. And I forgot to mention this when we talked about the don't water root vegetables. You can water edibles with gray water. You just can't let the gray water touch the part of the food you're going to eat. So a fruit tree is a great plant to water because the food's above the ground, the gray water is soaking down below, and there's no contact between the gray water and the food. If you want to water something like a lawn or a lot of really small plants, they need a more complex kind of system. So it's not that you can't do it, but you can't do it with a simple gray water system. You're going to be bumped into the more complex kind. I'm going to put my common error slide at the beginning just to try this out. Um, sometimes I'll do a talk and explain you know, all about gray water and then at the very end somebody it's like, but really, I want to do this thing, and they do want to do something that I was basically telling them not to do the entire presentation, but they were trying to figure out, like, how can I do this thing that I plan to do? So I'm going to put the thing that I don't want you to do at the very beginning of the, the gray water systems, just to see. And I'm not seeing that anyone on this webinar would do this, but these are really common things people want to do with water that don't work for a gray water system. Um, kind of a mixing up of rainwater system versus a gray water system. So storing gray water. You don't want to store gray water. It contains nutrients, uh, contains organic material. It will decompose and really get super stinky. You're also not allowed to store it more than 24 hours uh, by the code. But even if the code didn't speak about storage, you just don't want to do it because it gets pretty gross. It starts out like, you know, that your bath water is not very gross when you get out of the bath. But if you let it sit there for a week, it would not really look the same. So don't store gray water, um, especially not large tanks of, of gray water. The overuse of pumps is another common error. People want to move the water around and really feel like they have to control it. And with gray water, if you can use gravity, it's really, you know, it's never going to break. It doesn't take electricity. You can often have a gravity flow system, though, of course, it depends on your site. Uh, and then the misuse of filters. Um, sometimes people think they have to filter gray water. It's like a, a safety thing or it takes out stuff that they shouldn't go into their landscape. But filters are really just used in gray water to prevent clogging. And if you design your irrigation system to have larger outlets, you're not going to have clogging problems. So you can bypass the need for a filter by having bigger outlets with the simple gray water systems. Sometimes you do need them, and I'm going to talk about systems that have filters in them, but you don't always. So I just want you to think about, you know, could you have a simpler system to meet your needs, because it will probably last longer. It will take less maintenance. So the first simple system is called a laundry to landscape. This is just a name, and I saw that some of you have installed this system. It's one of my favorites. It was invented by a man named Art Ludwig of Oasis Design. Some of you have probably heard of him and read his book. So it's a washing machine system that in California, it doesn't require a permit. You're not altering the plumbing. Um, and you're just following basic guidelines. This is, the code is state by state, so I see we have people from other states. So I'm pretty much just going to talk to California code, but if you have questions, I could at the end talk to other codes. So in California, no permit, doesn't change your plumbing, um, and you have basic guidelines you have to follow. So this is what it looks like. You have your washing machine. It's pumping out the water. Normally, it pumps it right into your sewer or septic connection. So instead, you divert it. You, so you put it your the washer discharge hose to a valve and now you can control do you want it to go to your sewer or if you turn the handle do you want it to go out to your new gray water irrigation system that you have designed and constructed so in the picture if you see the blue the machine is pumping out that water it's going to the valve it's turned to gray water side so it's going out to the landscape 
this is a conceptual drawing, so that it actually would be covered up to below surface irrigation, but in the concept, you can see how it flows out to your landscape. It's similar to a drip system, but it's not a drip. It has bigger outlets because the water is not filtered. So it contains flint, debris, uh, and this is coming out these larger outlets that are then being filtered by the wood chips in the landscape. The costs, it's about usually 150 to 250 in parts. Um, that will go up if you need to buy plants or mulch or other parts that are kind of connected to the system, but just in terms of the pipes. That's about the, the average costs. If you want to hire somebody, it's, it can be quite simple. Like if this was your home, um, that would be a quite simple installation. But many times you have obstacles or it takes more time. You have to go under things or around things. Um, so the range about usually it's between $700 or $2,500 for a professional installation. And this is a great do-it-yourself project. So if you do, if you put in a drip system or if you do handiwork on your own home, you can definitely install a laundry to landscape system. Here's some pictures. You can see in the home, there's a valve. There's a sewer going back to your sewer and then going to the landscape. It has to get out somehow. So you have to either go through the floor and then through the crawl space to get out or go through the wall <clears throat> if you're on an exterior. When you're in the landscape, you're using one inch tubing. So it's a bit bigger than a drip system and half inch outlets. And you've dug mulch basins where the gray water is filtering through the wood chips and soaking into the ground. And the outlets are covered by what's called a valve box or a mulch shield. So where the gray water comes out is actually in the air and that prevents roots from growing in. So you can kind of see that th those black things have open bottoms. So the water just flows out the bottom and it's sitting in wood chips. <clears throat> There's limitations. Um, you can't have endless amount of outlets. So typically if you have a top loading machine, they pump out a lot of water. So you can go up to a maximum of 20 locations. So it'd be 20 of those black boxes. If you have a front loading machine, you can go to a maximum of about eight. If you have one of the really high efficient front machines, front loading machines, then you want to go down to maybe six. Some of them, four might be the maximum. So you're limited to how far you can spread out that water. Um, so they're great for trees or plants that are going to need a bit more water. Less good for really trying to spread this over a big area. This is a finished, two finished landscapes. One on the left is in Los Angeles. The one on the right is in San Francisco. Um, you can see the, it's a row of fruit trees on the left and those green little green circles are the tops of those valve boxes. So if you were to open that up, you'd see where the gray water was coming out and you would see air and then you'd see wood chips and the water would soak through the wood chips and then water the roots of those trees. And on the right, you can, it's kind of hidden in all those plants. Um, so I'm going to take a little time to go into some details. Um, this is an overview webinar, so I, has, I don't want to give like too much information, but I want to give you enough so you know that there's more to it than just putting some pipes together. So this is a little bit of the design. I'm going to go a little bit quickly here, um, so please don't feel overwhelmed. Just know that these are some things that if you're going to build a system that you need to think through and go back and take some time. And you're going to have lots of resources so you can go and get that info. So there are really specific locations for where to put these things in really kind of specific components um, to make your system work well. The three-way valve, it has to be at the flood rim of your machine. So as tall as your washer is, or it could be a bit taller. And the hose goes to the middle port. But as you can see in the pictures, it can look really differently depending on how your, your setup is. Um, but they all, there's, those two things have to be followed in every system. You can also get fancy. Um, the, this is a, a system where they wanted the valve to be hidden away. You, ha you have to be able to access it because you, if you ever need to turn the, the valve, it should be right by the machine, really easy to see. Um, but it can be like here, it was, this is a custom little kind of nook for it with matching, matching the cabinets. And you can see it took a lot more work. They had to cut the walls um, and then patch all the sheetrock, but you can definitely make this kind of fit into the aesthetics of a higher end home or just somebody who wants it to match everything, whatever kind of aesthetics you have, you can make it work. It just might take a little more effort than strapping that thing right to the wall of your laundry room. 
And before you start, I want you to think about the pump filter. This is something that some people don't even know exists. Other people are like, oh yeah, I have to clean that thing every month. Your front loading machine has a filter in it that will get clogged with stuff that's in people's pockets. And usually when you put in a gray water system that's connected to your washer and your washer ever has a problem, your gray water system will be blamed regardless of whether it had anything to do with your gray water system or not. So I like to alert people to this pump filter because if your washer doesn't pump out the water, it's almost always because the pump filter is clogged. And you just have to go in there and open it up and clean it out. If you have a stacked washer, it can be a bit trickier. Um, sometimes they're in a very narrow little nook. Sometimes there's room to put a valve on the side of a stacked washer, but there are situations where it's you know, not as easy as the pictures you see in all the different gray water books. The hardest part of the system is getting the pipe out of the house. This is the only part you really want to make sure you know what you're doing or get help because if you're drilling through your wall, so you can see in this picture, it's not empty space. There's electrical wires, there could be gas lines, there's plumbing pipes. There's all sorts of things that you don't see when the sheetrock is covered. So this is where you really want to make sure that you have chosen the right place to drill through that wall or get help doing that. There's a component called the anti-siphon. And that makes it so the washing machine doesn't accidentally become getting siphoned out. If you have a downward sloping yard and the machine pumps the water out, it starts this kind of siphon action. And if you don't have this in there, it can actually suck the water out of your machine and keep it being sucked out so your machine can never finish its cycle. And this is just a little piece that lets air drop into your system and breaks a siphon. Um, so I'm going to talk now about how much water, how to figure that out, what plants to water, and how many plants you can water. And I'm going to give you some resources to do this. So you want to know how much water you have in your washing machine. So there's a basic formula, your number of loads per week, gallons per load, and that's going to be your gallons per week of gray water. And that's pretty easy to do. And then you want to pick appropriate plants. So I already mentioned that the larger plants are really well suited. Trees, fruit trees are great, shrubs and bushes, your larger perennials. The food crops again are fine as long as you're not touching them. And you're looking for your plants with the lar your larger root zones. So if this was your yard and you said I would want to do a laundry to landscape gray water system, you would look around the perimeters of the yard, trees, bushes. You also might say, wow, that's a really big lawn. Maybe I could reduce the size of my lawn or can inspire you to take some other uh, projects on. And then you need to know, well, how much water do my plants want? And I'm going to show you a really simple formula um, and then a resource. So you don't actually have to use this formula. In basically much of California, in like the Oakland, California, in Santa Rosa, in Los Angeles, they're all similar enough that this formula is going to work for you. If you're in like the desert um, or if you're in San Francisco, it's not going to. You're going to, I could give you a different one, which I'm not going to say on the webinar because most of you are in this, this formula's uh, zone. Um, the peak irrigation needs of your plants, they need about a half a gallon per week per square foot of planted area. So you just need to figure out how big is your plant and then cut that number in half and that's how many gallons per week your plant needs during the summer. So this is a peak irrigation. If you're watering low water use plants, like drought resistant plants, then that's gonna be way too much water. You would cut that number again in half. And that's going to give you a pretty good estimate. It's going to be much better than just randomly guessing and sending water up to your yard. Um, so if you had a hedge that was 20 square feet and it was a, let's say it was like a fruiting hedge, like a kiwi or something. It's not really a hedge, that's a vine, but um, medium water use plant, maybe multiply that by half and you would get 10 gallons per week. Finding the area is pretty easy. You just multiply length times width or find the area of a circle and then that's all you need to know. Um, so we're going to skip that. There's this wonderful lady named Lori Palmquist who's in the Bay Area and she's created all these apps. So you guys don't have to do any irrigation calculations anymore. You can go to her website called Puddle Stompers and she has all these different apps for finding your soil type, for calculating how much water your plants need, just all sorts of things. Um, very, very useful. So you can go there and if you work in landscaping and don't know about this website, I think you will love it. And so you can plug in, where do I live? Uh, what's the time frame? Is what kind of plant this is? You do need to know a little bit about your plants, like are they low water use plants or medium water use plants? And then how big is the plant? And then you hit calculate. And when I did an example, I was thinking of a, a small fruit tree. Um, 
it needs about 11 gallons per week in July. And if I did that again in October, you can see it needs about seven gallons. So you don't, you, it's good to know your maximum needs, but you don't have to meet those needs all year long. And there's way more. I'm going to go a little faster, but just go and check it out. There's also great resources for landscapes with like plant lists and drip irrigation designs and all sorts of really great resources. So if you're into plants and irrigation, you should check out the website. Um, so for people that do irrigation, gray water can be kind of challenging because you are limited with how much water is being used in the home. So my basic advice is you want to try to match the gray water with the plant water needs as best you can. So you're really trying to match, which is quite different than just programming a controller or uh, something else, some other you know, way where you can decide how much water to give your plants. You want to maximize your efficiency. So remember, don't you don't have to meet those peak needs all year long, but you do want to know what they are. Um, and then if you have other irrigation, make sure you're shutting it off. So if you, let's say you had like diff three different zones in your backyard and one of them you put gray water to, make sure you remember to shut off your irrigation zone so you save water. Sometimes people forget that last part and then they end up like double watering their landscape, which is not going to save you any water. If you find out that you have a lot of water, like way too much water for, like, let's say you have a front loader, but you do just a lot of many, many loads per week, um, and you can't distribute it as much as you want, you can create a two zone system with the laundry to landscape. It's a little more pipes and it can look a little funny. Um, well, maybe it looks really nice, actually. It's not, it looks, this is what it looks like, one option. You can have two valves, so one valve turns your system on or off, and the other valve goes from zone one to zone two, and that can be right by your machine. So you could water maybe your front yard and your side yard or whatever combination that you need. But this is, the system does not have multiple zones other than this two-zone system if you really need it. Hardscape might have to go under it or around it. That middle picture is a daily axe, Erin. I don't know if you <laughs> might recognize some people in here. Crossing stairs, you know, you can, sometimes your site is not so simple, so you, you might have to go around things and over things. And then if you have a flat yard, you're limited to about 50 feet, and that's because the washing machine is what's pushing this water through. So it's a low pressure system connected to your washer. And it's not made to pump water really far, or really high. But if you do the calculations between a washer pump, it can go up a certain number of feet. Instead of going up, you can go across. So 50 feet is a good number to keep in mind. If you're going downhill, you can go as far as you want, but you might have challenges with the water, only wanting to go to the bottom of your site, not the top. So you can serpentine or kind of snake that tubing down your hillside to slow down the water. And if your yard goes uphill, you can't, you can't use this type of system. You'll need a different system that has a, a pump just designed for pumping up gray water. Um, so you're building these basins and you need to make sure they're big enough so your water soaks into the ground. Um, there you can see within the system, the basin is dug around the kind of the drip line of the plant. It's not too close, it's not too far away. It's where the branches end. That's the optimum location and the water spreads around the basin. That would all be filled with wood chips, but you can see that you're not actually just watering one place part of the tree, you're watering a bigger area that a whole basin is getting wet. Clay soils need larger basins than sandy soils. And there's some calculations of how to do this in the resources, so I'm not gonna really go over actually how you calculate. Um, but I will say that if you don't do it right and you see pooling water, it's so easy to change, you just make your basin bigger. So it's a very, if you don't do it right, it's not a big problem, just make it bigger. You're preventing clogging by covering up the outlets with these called mulch shields, um, different materials, make sure it's really sturdy. And then you want to have the end of the line somewhere where all the water can flow out. This is a safety feature so you don't accidentally damage your washing machine. So it can end in a, a, one, a full open line or it can come up in the air somewhere and kind of be only if the sump system clogs up then water would shoot out this this like little tube in a random spot and you would know, oh, something's wrong with my system. But you wouldn't find out by having damage to your machine. Um, so I'm gonna stop there. Are there any laundry to landscape specific questions? We have some pretty general questions, but not anything uh, specific to laundry to landscape. So I think some of these could be addressed at the very end. Okay, great. 
So we're going to leave Longy to landscape. And now any other kind of gray water, you are now in the drainage of your plumbing. So it's a whole different situation. You now have to be below the fixture. You have to cut into the fixture. And this is going to in California trigger a permit because you've now cut into your plumbing and now you're redirecting your gray water from below the fixture itself out to your landscape. Um, you put an diverter valve, so you want you still want to be able to control the flow, and then you also add what's called a backwater valve, and that prevents the sewage. If there's a backup in your sewer system, you don't want that to back up and then go out into your yard without you ever knowing it happened. That would be terrible and gross. So you put in a backwater valve. It's like a one-way valve, and that just prevents it. Just if a sewage sewage backed up, it would just get stopped at that valve, and then nothing would go into your garden. So here's what this looks like. You can see on the left, there's that diverter valve coming from the house. It's going down into the valve. So one side of the valve goes to the sewer and the other side goes to the landscape. You can imagine well, this is in my little teeny crawl space. What if I wanna bleach my hair? Do I have to crawl under there and turn off my gray water? Um, well, you, no, you don't have to. <laughs> you would put in what's called an actuator. It's a, a motor that just sits right on top of that valve and it plugs into a little switch and then you can put that switch in your bathroom or some lo convenient location and then you can just flip the switch and it will turn your valve. So it should be convenient there by hand if your site is set up that way or by a switch and a motor. Um, so the backwater valve, I just mentioned that, but that's kind of what it looks like. You don't want to forget about this. It's in the code, but in case you're um, maybe not in California or you're not following the code, there are parts that are really for your own good, so don't skip the backwater valve. So you can see that little flapper. So the water's flowing one way, but it can't come back the other way. It shuts off that little flapper. So I'm gonna talk about a system. This is another just specific kind of system called a branch drain. It's a gravity flow system. It was also invented by Art Ludwig. And to install this system, you have to access the drainage plumbing. So sometimes people think about, oh, I want to do a shower gray water. And I'm like, oh, where's your shower pipes? And they think, oh, it's actually buried in the concrete slab of my house. So sometimes your house might be really inaccessible. You can't actually access it without some major renovations. Other times you have a crawl space. Sometimes pipes are on the outside of the house. There might be a basement. But wherever, however your house is set up, you need to be able to get to those pipes. And then the landscape has to be lower than the pipes because this is a gravity flow. So here's the picture. The water is flowing from that tub. Following the blue line, there's that diverter valve. And now it's going out to the landscape. The system is, divides the flow in half. Each time it splits the flow, it's being split by half. So you can have half of your flow or a quarter or an eighth. And you design it so you're going to get the right amount of water to the different plants. And they're going to be in basins full of mulch. Um, all your pipes are buried. So this is just to give you the idea of what's going on. The cost, it's a bit more in materials, usually about 250 to 500. And to hire somebody, it's, it's more expensive. The system is very labor intensive because you're sloping the pipes. You have to keep everything going downwards by gravity. The washing machine system, the pump was pushing the water through. So you don't actually have to slope your tubing. But with this, you have to slope it because it's all flowing by gravity. It's a lot of work, a lot of digging. Um, but once it's installed, there's no moving parts. There's really nothing to break. Um, it's a very low maintenance system. So it works really well and it lasts a long time if your site is the right site for it and of the right kind of plants. Because this is great for basically for trees or bushes. It's not good at all for small plants. Um, so again, the, the amount of time it can take really varies. And permitting fees also vary greatly across the state. This is the fitting that you use to split the flow. It's called a double quarter bend or a twin 90 or a double L. The water comes in the middle and it splits it into half. So this fitting is actually flat. So the water splits evenly and then all the rest of your pipes are slipping down. That little white plug in there, you can adapt and put a little clean out so you can look in there and see if anything got stuck in the middle. <clears throat> and here's just a schematic of dividing up the flow. And the mulch shields, make sure you use something sturdy. Irrigation valve boxes are really good. A bucket can be really good. Any, in the kind of my earlier gray water days, they like to use flower pots because they're readily available, um, but they really don't hold up. So unfortunately, they're not a viable option for the long run. So you have to use something sturdy. 
Here's an example. Um, this is a system in San Francisco, so the yard is very small. That's the whole yard, but I like it because this is a small home, a one shower, one bathroom home, one tiny yard, and their shower waters their whole landscape. Um, in other homes, you might have a much bigger yard, but you might be more than a one bedroom um, home, and so you might have multiple systems or maybe a bigger branch drain system. But you can see the pipe is dividing up the flows. Um, on the right, there's a little mulch basin. This is San Francisco, so it's sandy soil, so it's not very, a not very big basin. If you have clay soils, that basin would need to be larger. The plants are planted adjacent to it. And then when you're done, the picture on the left, that was right after it was finished, the plants all got watered in. And then on the right, that's one year later, and the homeowner said they never watered their yard again. So it's a great kind of getting one piece of the, of the landscape off of potable water being watered by the shower. Um, so that's the gravity system. So after this, we're going to move into pump systems. Were there any kind of gravity flow specific questions that I should answer now? Um, we have a few folks coming back to not only the gravity flow system, but as well as the uh, laundry to landscape system. So we did have one individual asking about uh, with multiple outlets, how you can make sure that the water flows evenly to each outlet. That's a great question. And I skipped the whole tuning the system part. I was kind of how much information in an overview. Um, but yeah, that's a that's like after you build the system, then you tune the system. So you do, you run the water through it. There's a way you can connect a garden hose. You just have, you know, on-demand water coming through the system. You you separate the system. So it's totally isolated from the um, because a garden hose is connected to your, your potable drinking water and you don't want that connected to your washing machine. So you separate the system you put on the garden hose and you can test it out and see how water flows. There's little, they're called full port ball valves. So there are little valves that have a big opening and you can put them on as needed to adjust the flows. You can often do a lot by just making sure the pipes are sloping, like sometimes little T's are sticking up and water doesn't come out so you can angle them down. So there's a lot of just adjusting you can do to get the flows evenly. Um, if you want more water to one plant than another, then you can put two outlets. So if you have like a tree and then a small little bush, you could put two outlets at your tree and one at your small little bush. Great, thank you. Uh, I think some of the rest can still be addressed later on. Okay. So now we're going to move into pump systems. Like what if your yard goes up a hill or what if you have a big cement patio and you have to get across that first before you get into your landscape. You're gonna need electricity to pump the water. So this kind of system is called a simple pump system. It doesn't have any filters. So basically you have your diverter valve under your house somewhere and you can now redirect the gray water. So you have a gray water line, it's coming into a tank. Uh, it could be in the basement, in the crawl space, outside of the house, depending on your your setup, but the gray water flows into this tank. You're not you're not storing the water. You can call, think of it as a surge tank. It's taking a surge of water. It's collecting no more than a day's worth of gray water. So 24 hours is how long the maximum time you want to store it. So it's not a big tank. It's usually at a single family home, 30 gallons to maybe 50. And then it has a pump in it that's designed to pump dirty water. So it's an effluent pump. The pump can pump out the hair, the lint, you know, all the whatever gunky stuff gets down the drain without clogging up. So it has the float switch. So when your tank fills up with water, it engages your pump, your pump pumps out all the water and the flow in the, the tank is emptied. There's an overflow, because what if power goes out? So you're overflowing back to sewer. You want to have a one of those backwater valves. So if your sewer clogs, you don't have sewage going into your tank and then being pumped out. That's a terrible thing you wouldn't want. Um, and then you have it going out into your into your landscape, similar to the laundry system. So that's kind of the basic about it. You do need to plug in the pump. That can be one of the more challenging things if you're doing a retrofit is having an outlet. You need a, a nearby outlet for this. Here's some pictures of what it looks like. The one on the left is in a basement. Uh, the one on the right is in a crawl space. You can see water coming in, the diverter valve overflow, water going out. Um, there's another option. This is a little pump. It's actually kind of a combined, it's not even a tank, it's just like this little thing. <laughs> it's called a sandy flow. It's designed for homes that are, have a something in the basement where they have to pump up to their sewer line. So it's a gray water pump and it's just designed to pump gray water a little bit. Um, 
and you can see you have to have a it has to gravity flow into it so you have to pump your washer your washer has to pump into the a utility sink and then that flows into the sandy flow pump and then it pumps it out but if you want a small compact um, pretty easy to install system you can look at this as an option or if your washing machine is in a basement and you your laundry system can't pump it out on its own this is the kind of system you would have and then you can hook up a laundry to landscape irrigation system to this little sandy flow pump they also make them for showers so keep that in mind if you need need to pump but you don't have all your gray water going to the the system. And just to reiterate, the irrigation component of these simple pump systems is exactly the same as a laundry to landscape. So it's still one inch tubing, um, half inch outlets, your all the whatever kind of gunky stuff that got in the water is getting pumped out and it's going into your wood chips, which are your filter. If you don't use wood chips and you put all that gunky stuff, it will clog the soil and then you won't get infiltration. You'll get puddles of gray water on the surface, which you don't want. So the wood chips are a key part. They're filtering the water, but in a way that you don't have to clean that filter at a frequent time as frequently. It's still about, it's about once a year maintenance. So you do need to monitor your basins, but only about once a year. If you were to try to keep all that gunk in, in some kind of artificial filter before it got out, you would need to clean it a lot more frequently. Um, so speaking of filters, so there are systems that are pumped and they go through a small filter that you have to manually clean. They're designed for drip irrigation. So the picture on the right is just to remind everyone what drip irrigation is. That's not a gray water <laughs> drip irrigation system. You would not want to water baby lettuce with your gray water. Um, but just that's drip irrigation. So the water is coming out these small outlets. It can spread out over a big area. The picture on the left, that is a gray water filter. They have to be cleaned pretty frequently, this particular kind of filter. Um, there are a couple of manufactured products on the market that do this, but if you ever are gonna purchase a gray water system and you have, you're purchasing something that requires you to clean the filter out on a regular basis, you should really pause and say, well, am I really gonna do this on a regular basis for like the next 10 years? Um, and most people aren't, they might say they are, but that's, <laughs> they usually don't. What can work is, someone gets a maintenance contract with the installer and like people happen to have landscaping contracts, people come and do their lawn or whatever, they come on a regular basis to their home and do some kind of pretty simple task. Cleaning and gray water filter could be one of that. So if you really want a, a manually cleaned filter, I would encourage you to get a maintenance contract or somehow have it on a schedule where it doesn't rely on you re remembering to clean out the filters. Because if you're like any other human, you probably will forget. And then the water will have nowhere to go. It's gonna, your pump is gonna be trying to pump through this clogged filter and it will burn out your pump. And then you'll have to buy a new pump and that's expensive and it'll basically lead to system failure. Um, but once, so we're gonna, we're gonna stay on filtering for a little bit. So once you've filtered gray water, you have a couple of other options for spreading the water out more. There's, this is the mechanical valve, it's called an indexing valve. And the way it works is every time the pump turns on, it pumps out the water through one of these outlets. And then the valve lifts up and then it sets down into another port. So they come in you know, th four, I think it's like two, three, four. You can basically go between from up to eight different outlets depending on the brand you buy. And so you can have multiple zones of gray water without needing electricity or a controller in your yard. And the water doesn't have to be super clean, but it does require some filtration. So this can expand your options in, in, type, in terms of you know, what part of your landscape are you going to water with gray water. And so then we're going to come into the kind of mid-range systems. These are getting a bit more expensive. I don't have prices on all these. Um, but you can look them up, um, but they do get you into the buying a couple thousand dollars for the pieces and then to put it, install it, that's going to be even more because they're more complicated to install. These are two, um, I'll call them mid-range systems. Grayflow is one. It cleans the filter by sending compressed air up against the filter and then the next flow of gray water washes out the debris and flushes it to the sewer. And it has a roto valve, so is it indexing valve, that can go up to six zones. And then it comes with, you can purchase, the, it's called gray water compatible drip irrigation. So even when you filter gray water, it's not as clean as, as municipal water, so you can't use standard drip system. You have to use drip system made for dirty water. And if you don't, then the drip system will clog. 
The next one is called Water Lab, and Water Lab is a local company on Russell. His uh, installation company is called Water Sprout, and he has Water Lab, so he's kind of, now he's selling these um, different systems that he's done lots of R&D over the years and installed lots of them around um, California. I actually have this basic one in my house now because we have, a, it's a multifamily situation and the landscape has to be, it's, it had to be pumped no matter what. So I wanted to try out a new system. Um, and I'm, it's only been a year, but I'm, so far I'm very happy with it. It works great. So it's a low maintenance. It's a once a year maintenance and it goes with to gray water compatible drip. And it has a roto valve too. So we have six different zones. And then we get to the more, we'll call them like the smart system. So Water Lab sells a smart system and these are, come with, they can come with a controller. They can bring in water, the filter is automatically cleaned. Um, so it kind of takes you into another level of irrigation system with gray water. The Water Renew or Irrigray is another option that's in a similar kind of category where you can control a lot with the irrigation. It basically functions like a standard um, automatic irrigation system. And they are more compl complicated. The cost goes up and the, you know, what could go wrong, that goes up too when you have more components to your system. And so when you think about what system you want in your home, so the first question is, what sources of gray water can you access? And that's going to determine a lot. And after this, we're going to do poll number two. How much gray water does your home produce? So it's important to do this and you know there is a range, but you want to get as accurate as you can. And also think about, is something going to change? Are people going to move in or out of the home? Is, are you going to buy a new washing machine? Um, can you get a better shower head that uses less water? It's always good to conserve first. The you know, reduce, reuse, recycle, it's the same with gray water. So we want to reduce first and then start to reuse the water. So think about, is something going to change before you put in the system? And then what plants are you going to water? Um, remember the hydro zone. So whatever zone you have the gray water on, try to keep plants that have similar water needs together. So you're not, you're meeting the needs of your plants without overwatering some and underwatering some. And then you're gonna choose a system to meet your needs. And we'll do poll number two. So for those of you who are planning to install a system, what kind are you thinking of? And maybe you're not planning to install because maybe you found out, oh, my home really, it's not gonna really work what I thought I wanted to do. Definitely a variety of answers here. Yeah. Thus far, most people are looking at a laundry to landscape system. Give us just a few more seconds here. All right, we have just about 75% of people voting. So I'm gonna go ahead and end this poll and share the results with everybody. Yes, I see a lot of laundry to landscape. Um, and something I want to mention is sometimes people think like simple, like I'll do a simple one first, but it's just like a stepping stone to get to a more advanced system. And they're not, they're not that like advanced or sophisticated or complex or whatever you want to call them. They're not better than the simple systems. They're just different. So if your landscape works to only be irrigated with laundry to landscape and branch drain, then that's going to be your, your best option for the long term um, because they really have less less to go wrong, less moving parts, less to break down, uh, either easier to fix. But then depending on your landscape, your landscape just might not be suitable to be irrigated with that kind of system. So I just want you to, they're not like, a, it's not a hierarchy, it's a, it's a matching scenario. And multiple systems, that's very common. Um, other, and there's more systems. I'm, tonight in this talk, we're talking about kind of the tried and true or the what's available, um, the manufactured systems, some of them are not quite tried and true because they, they, they come out, they're, they're always new systems. So you want to wait for a couple years before really saying they're tried and true. But the ones you build yourself, these are tried and true. And that's kind of one trying to steer you into something that's going to work. And there's so many other ways you can use gray water too. And all the, all the things I say don't do, the only reason I say that is because I've probably done it. <laughs> so it's good to experiment too. Okay, so we'll go on. Um, and as you're planning gray water, I just want you to think 
about your whole site and think about how you can integrate gray water with your other supplies of water. Um, thinking about where you may not have gray water or rainwater supply, that might be a great place for a rain garden or, well, no, rain gardens do require rain gar uh, rainwater. Maybe you could have a great place for like a very low water section of your yard. Um, thinking about how you can stack functions, like you might need a privacy screen. And so maybe you want to grow bamboo, which is a great thing to water with gray water. Or <clears throat> try and, maybe you have an open slate and you say, think, where should I plant my fruit trees? Think about, well, where can I get my gray water to? And that's where I might be able to plant my fruit trees. So really trying to plan out your whole landscape, but not getting stuck in like, you have to have it all decided before you can do one thing. Just before you do that first thing, just think about how it's gonna fit into your larger, the larger picture of your site. And so I want to do a little um, activity, just a, kind of thinking about what system you would install here. So this, let's say this is your friend site and they say, look, in my house, I have this huge crawl space. Aren't you jealous? It's three feet tall. I have a downward slope in my front yard. I want to plant a bunch of fruit trees. You guys took a gray water class. Like, what do you think I should, what do you think I should do? So just take a minute and think about the systems that I talked about or things that you've already learned about gray water and think about what you would recommend in this site. And we'll do poll number three. So would you recommend they install a laundry landscape, branch drain, simple pump or filtered system, or maybe a combination of laundry landscape with a branch drain? Okay, so I'm seeing combos and laundry to landscape branch drain. Nobody said pump. <laughs> We've got downward, downhill yard. Definitely don't need a pump here. And we don't need filters either because these are fruit trees. We don't have to spread the water out to a big area. Um, they can be just fine with the laundry to landscape and branch drain. Do you want to share the results? Yeah. Looks like most people voted for the combo, laundry to landscape with branch drain. Yeah, that's probably, you would need a little more information, like how many people live in the home, how much gray water there is. Um, you know, there's a bit more information needed, but basically it'd be great to, on um, let's say the, the shower is on one side of the house, use that water to irrigate that portion of the landscape and the washing machine is on the different side of the house, use that water to water that side of the, of the landscape. So something that would be no, you'd have to know where the fixtures are located, how much water, but this is the concept. So we're going to do a couple of resources and then end with more questions. So these are two books that I wrote and with the goal of do, having some do-it-yourself information, kind of the whole design and installation process for people. The Waterwise Home has gray water, rainwater, and composting toilets, and then gray water, green landscape is just gray water. So this is a good resource if you really want to go through the kind of the whole process, or if you want to share it with somebody who might do it for you. Because sometimes people want to bring in a professional that doesn't have training, so giving them a resource can be really helpful because they might do something that possibly could be done better with, if they had more information. Um, our website, graywateraction.org, we have a lot of good resources. We have a bunch of information in Spanish and in Mandarin. Um, we also have a higher installer page. So, and there's several Sonoma County people here who've gone through our training. So if you wanna find an installer who's gone through a training, you can look on Grey Water Action. There's also a forum. So if you have technical questions in the future, you can always go there and post your questions. So we really try to make the website useful for people wanting to do Grey Water. And I'm gonna end there and that's my email and that's the website again. So if you guys have any more questions in the future, we can be in touch over email. This is where we all applaud and express our gratitude. Thank you so much for all of this, Laura. We definitely have an abundance of questions here and we'll do our best to get all things answered. Uh, so let's see, one of the first ones Sasha asks, what is the general durability of a system? How often do they break down? What is the maintenance like? That is such an important question because if it doesn't last um, and takes too much maintenance, it, it, won't, it won't last. The simple systems, they are 
the durability is pretty good. The most common problem with longitudinal landscape is somebody putting their shovel or their pickaxe through the tubing. <laughs> That's happens to me. It actually happened last week. <laughs> um, wasn't me, but it's just, you know, people forget where the tubing is and they just, and it's so easy to fix. You just cut into it, you put in a coupling. It's basically like if you damage your drip system, which anyone who has drip, I'm sure you have done the same thing at one, one time in your life. Um, you just put in a coupling. So that longitudinal landscape, in terms of breaking down, that's really, usually it's like somebody accidentally breaks something and then it's easy to fix. Um, branch drain, the pipes are a lot stronger, so they don't usually get damaged so easily. But the, the basins for both of those are the maintenance. So they're about once a year. Um, when you first put in your system, you do need to check on it, make sure things are flowing as you've designed. You might have to make a bunch little adjustments here and there over the first couple of weeks. But once it's all flowing well, it's just your basin. So once a year, you have to go out there, look in your basin, do you see wood chips if you see air after so the tubing and then air and then wood chips then that's you're done um, if you see dirt or if you see you don't see your outlet anymore it's gotten covered up by dirt or um, you know sometimes if you have gophers there's all sorts of things that can like fill in your basins that can be a problem actually gophers can be a problem um, but basically it's the once a year so you remove the soil, the decomposed mulch, and you put in fresh wood chips. It's usually a pretty small job. It's like a trowel kind of job, the first couple years, and then it might turn into a shovel. You need to use your shovel after like year three, you might need to do a bit more removal. Um, but it's once a year, so I feel like that's really manageable. If you have a filter that you have to clean, that's where systems really can fail because the filter clogs, then the system gets abandoned or um, anything that has more kind of uh, components can be the, the failure point. Great, thank you. We have Liz asking, uh, in the case where a permit is required, is a licensed plumber required to do the install or only certain parts of the installation? Yeah, great question. So to get a permit, um, a homeowner can pull their own permit and then they can do their own work. They can't pull a permit and then hire someone, that's not allowed, but you can have a consultant, um, a designer, you can pull a permit and do your own work have your friends help, um, that's one scenario. You can hire a plumber. So to pull the gray water permit, usually plumber, plumbers can definitely get the gray water permit. Landscape contractors can sometimes, it depends on where you are, because really gray water is mostly landscaping. Um, they aren't gonna want to put in the valve probably, but if you can get a plumber to put in the valve, a landscape contractor would be the best person to actually put in a gray water system for you. Um, plumbers sometimes do, um, there, it's a very rare plumber. Christina Bertia from Greywater Action is like one of the rare plumbers who knows how to install greywater systems. Um, usually plumbers never do landscaping. So asking a plumber, I mean, people often are told it's illegal, you can't do that, it'll never work. And so I, don't ask a plumber unless they know, they know about greywater. Um, if you have the valve and you show them a picture, they'll probably put it in, but they'll, they'll probably tell you that it's not going to work, um, that's not the right valve, you know, all these things that might discourage you, but um, yeah. So anyway, plumber, landscape contractor, general contractor, or yourself, the homeowner, if you're a homeowner. Fantastic, thank you. We have somebody who has a septic tank and a leach field, and they're wondering if they should even be looking into a gray water system. Yeah, so um, that's a, that question, some people say there's a lot of variation on opinions about that, but typically septic systems get overloaded with water. And so taking out gray water can help the system because you're, you're having more retention time in the septic tank. And so better quality water is going to go out. That said, sometimes, um, and this is true for not on a septic, sometimes people's plumbing doesn't slope properly. So the, the plumbing is actually relying on gray water to push the water along because it maybe it's flat or possibly even sloped the wrong way. And so if you take out gray water, you might have issues with flow. And that's not because of gray water. If the system was designed properly, it wouldn't happen. But sometimes plumbing systems are just not. They have come out of slope or they were put in wrong or et cetera. So you could be aware of that. Um, but it's, it's, if your system is set up right, then it should not be a problem. I know you spoke to some of the product recommendations for a uh, washing machine system, but do you have any recommendations for shower gray water? Um, yeah, so it's less, I say whatever people feel comfortable with, like asking someone to change their products, their shower products is really different than their laundry detergent. 
Um, what I like to say is if you feel, so there, there's a, there's a website called the, it's called Skin Deep or the Cosmetic Database and it's the Environmental Working Group puts it out and you can put in your shampoo and all this stuff and see what's in your ingredients. It'll tell you how toxic it is or not. Um, and that's sort of just, it's good to be aware of what products you use and what's in them. They're usually, the bad stuff in shampoos are usually not bad for plants. They're, just, they're actually bad for us, for people. So I do, if, I do like that website and I've definitely changed my products when I, when I used it. Um, but it wasn't a gray water concern. It was more of like, ooh, I don't want to be putting that on my body. Um, so other than hair dye and bleach, there's not much you could do in a shower um, with terms of like shampoo and conditioner that would be harmful to your plants. We've got Luz asking a potentially heavy question here. They ask, do you have a sense of how likely it is that we'll be able to transition away from current wastewater infrastructure that uses potable water versus waterless solutions at a large scale? Um, let me see if I understand this question. Waterless solutions, like composting toilets? Yeah, potentially composting toilets or maybe just uh, recycled water solutions is kind of how I'm interpreting this. Yeah, and there, there's a lot happening. California is really leading um, in a lot of ways with, at the state level with some, um, this is not exactly answering the question, but there are some like big advances in the model of water efficient landscape ordinance, which is now regulating how what kind of landscapes people put in because landscapes, you know, are such a big water user. And there's been kind of a gains and losses around water reuse like it, it can be harder the big systems um, but California has done a lot and is, is still working on doing more. San Francisco is a great place to look at what they've done with their non-potable ordinance they're requiring non systems in buildings that are over a certain size um, to use some type, type of non-potable water and they've they're working at the state level to try to make the regulations better and easier for other places to do that. Um, so yeah, I think it's moving in a good direction and we still have plenty of room for improvement. That is for sure. Thank you for that. We have Maria asking, can you use gray water in large planters? Um, I actually deleted a slide. I was worried I had too many slides. I deleted one of my favorite slides that's from Santa Rosa that's a large planter um, that Susie Murray, who used to work for the city or she used to run the gray water program, uh, it's at her house. It's one of those wine barrels and the half wine barrels planters. And that's a great example of sometimes you can, it depends on the situation. You have to be over soil because if the gray water drains through, it needs somewhere to go. And she had had one little outlet right in the middle and then little flowers planted all along, all around the outlet in a wine barrel. So if it's, a, if it's big enough and it, and it can drain into soil, then it can definitely work. Um, and that's code compliant. There's, so there's like the code and then there's what you can do and what you should do. And they're not always the same answer. Sometimes people don't have a, an option for gray water and they're like dumping somewhere that's really not healthy um, into a waterway. And in that scenario, a planter, though it's not going to be co-compliant, but neither is what they were doing in the first place, you could have a closed planter and try to just soak up all the water in the plants. That's definitely something that's done and can be done, but it is not co-compliant. Somebody is asking, how often do the filters in a pump system need to be cleaned? If I ask the installer to do regular maintenance, how often would that be? It depends on the filter and the flow rates. Um, so it's a little bit hard to say, but I would, I would say three months could be a number to keep in mind. Um, but it, it really depends on how big the filter is and how much flow is going through. So the size of the household. Uh, we have Andrew asking for clarification for the laundry to landscape system. He says, can you explain or link to the blow off that you mentioned to protect the washer? Yeah, so, so this is connect, directly connected to your washer. So let's say you put in a laundry to landscape system and then you forget about it. You like never do maintenance, not once for like a couple years. And now all of those little outlets you put at your plants are totally clogged up. So the washer is trying to pump out all the water, but it has nowhere to go because it's clogged up and you didn't do your annual maintenance. So you want to design a system where even if someone did that, it wouldn't cause a problem to the machine. Um, so we want a place for all that water to go. And so there's kind of two options. You want to have a full one inch opening somewhere in the system that doesn't get all the water when you don't want it to. So one option can be if you, at the end of the line, you had to run your tubing like up, maybe you hide it by a plant or 
corner of a fence or you know just somewhere kind of hidden and out of the way you run it up like two or three feet and so normally no water comes out of that but let's say you never do your maintenance everything is clogged up and now the water there's nowhere for the water to go then it will come out of that end and you'll see water and you'll say oh i better go maintain my system but no damage has been done to your washer Great, thank you. We have Nick who's asking a potentially a specific question in Sonoma County that maybe you have some experience with Laura. They write, I am a general contractor based in West Sonoma County. I was wondering if there are other general contractors out there offering this kind of thing. We do it at home, but I'd like to start offering it as one of my services and was wondering how many folks out there are offering this as GCs, general contractors. I imagine more landscape contractors offering this service. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I know of, well, I know of one for sure, Lee Gerard. He's one of the most experienced installers in Southern California. His company is called Greywater Core. So he's a licensed architect and a general contractor. So he's a very skilled um, man. And he got his contractee's license after doing Greywater for a while. So he, I think he wanted to be general because then he could, well, you three trades, you know, he, Greywater can be three trades, almost any, um, installation but it is true Mo more people are landscape contractors but if you're general then you don't have to get a plumber involved per se though you might want to um i bet i feel like i know more than that but there's no i don't know very many i know of several that are interested but he's like the most he he's the most kind of farther along of being just doing gray water he pretty much just does gray water and rainwater. other people have their whole business and then they'll they'll add it here and there yeah, that's great. I will also mention that Daily Axe has a contractor's referrals list, primarily for Sonoma County. So if folks were interested in getting some support um, for all things gray water as well as rainwater, you can reach out to me and I'll uh, share my contact info at the end and we can send you that resource. Another great resource is actually uh, Quell, Qualified Water Efficient Landscapers, uh, and they display a whole interactive map uh, for a variety of different contractors and what their expertise are. And it's a really user-friendly resource as well. And I can go ahead and send that in my follow-up email. Uh, let's see, we have Sunny asking if all of the information in Greywater Green Landscape is also in the WaterWise Home. Sounds like she's thinking about getting the WaterWise Home resource. It was done after um, the publisher wanted to make it in color, have photos. So it's basically the same info, though it was done like two years later. So it's a little bit updated and uh, the images were in color and there were photographs. So we kind of went through, installed some systems and like documented the whole process. So there's more, more color, more photos, but the content is very similar to possibly, I don't know, I'd say like 95% identical. We have somebody who is trying to plan ahead with a gray water project and they're asking, what are the separate phases of the entire project start to finish? How long would it take? Any sample project plans if this had to be reviewed by someone prior to start? Like a new home construction? Is that Potentially, what? yeah, that's what I would think. Um, and this is also, the answer to this question may also apply for some folks who are rebuilding in Sonoma County. Yeah, so if you can think about gray water before you even site the house, I mean, that is such a huge plus. Like people have slopes, like you could put the house at the, if possible, you know, at the top of the slope and then you'd have all these gravity options. Um, the orientation of where the bathrooms are compared to where the landscape is, there's a lot you can do. So thinking about where you want to irrigate, like where your um, gray water is great for your like fruit trees, you know, all these, uh, they're not high water plants, but they definitely want irrigation. So thinking, and they want sun, most of them. So thinking about where you're going to plant and then how can you set your house up so it's easy to get the water to them. And sometimes you don't, maybe your house is already designed and that's fine. If it's not built, then you can at least uh, run like the pipes. If you need to move water across the house, it's much easier to do that when the walls are open. Um, you can just get everything where it needs to go before the walls are, are enclosed. And then it just gets so much more expensive to change things around after that. We have Dan writing, I know blackberries work for gray water, but what about raspberries? Raspberries, like, basically, if it likes water, it likes gray water. That's great. We have somebody asking, can AC condensate be a significant source for irrigation water? In a, in a big building, it can be a huge source. In a home scale, you know, it's mostly like you see them dripping out of the sides of buildings sometimes, like in the cities. 
um, it's not huge, but every, you know, it could water maybe one plant. But when you get to the larger building, um, and if you're in a climate that's hot and humid, then it can be an enormous amount of water. So it's important just to keep in mind as a potential source and then see if your situation makes it a, a viable source or not. Great, we have somebody looking at a diagram and has interest uh, and curiosity in the zoning slash setback requirements. They're asking specifically about rainwater storage tanks, a little bit off topic, but also definitely related. Um, yeah, so setbacks, they, uh, rainwater tanks, I don't know if there's setback requirements in the code or if that would be a local jurisdiction, but they're usually pretty easy to find your local um, city, if you're in the city or county, will just have the setbacks listed and it would be a tank. Sometimes it says tank, sometimes it says any structure. I mean, there's usually like a chart that shows your setbacks for like property lines and whatever they're requiring for. But I, I don't know off the top of my head if the code calls out a setback for the tank. It does on gray water, uh, for sure, like where you can put the water. What would you say is best for very small lawns slash fruit trees? Um, fruit trees, laundry to landscape is great. Uh, lawns are, you, it takes a more sophisticated slash expensive system. So I, to do it up to code, people, you know, dump their gray water on top of their lawn like that. People, you can keep your lawn green by reusing water, but you're, to put in a system that's following a code, um, you're going to be, it's going to be very expensive because you have to have the water extensively filtered subsurface. You want the filter to be automatically clean so you don't have to think about it. Um, so if small lawn, I'd say don't do it or <laughs> use your resources to try to make other things more efficient. Um, or maybe, you, maybe there's other part of the yard that could have other plants, but small, small lawns are probably not worth it. But of course it, it depends. <laughs> it always depends. Um, so I am going to go ahead and wrap up right now with some closing slides as we are reaching eight o'clock. We did have one person put in a plug for their water conservation technician program, which is a two year degree online. That is phenomenal. Brenda, I would ask that if you could email that to me, um, I'd be happy to share that with folks. But without any further ado, again, I do want to really thank Laura for being here today and educating us. And I'll reiterate that I do hope that folks are leaving with something new and sharing that back with their communities. Um, and as I try to pull up some of our closing slides, I will also begin to mention that uh, Daily Axe has an upcoming, or actually we just launched a Be The Change campaign. Um, because as I mentioned at the very beginning, we firmly believe that we all have the power to be the change that we wish to see in the world. And that change begins from within and with our personal actions. So, oops, let me get to that slide there. Uh, I want to put in the plug for this because throughout 2020, we're gonna be sharing resources with folks on how to grow a garden, how to build community, save resources and practice self-care. So in this follow-up email, I'll be putting out a call to action to all of you to register actions and share your stories with us. We find that so much inspiration and action is taken uh, when people share their stories and you can connect that way. So that is our Be The Change Challenge. Again, we'll have that all throughout 2020. We'll be sharing resources, how-to videos and stories for everybody to enjoy. Uh, and as you can imagine at this time, I do have to mention that we're a small nonprofit and this virus has definitely affected us. And so if you were able to donate today, that would allow us to continue to bring these programs to you all for free. Uh, and it's something that we absolutely love to do. So I had to put in a mention there. And it's a perfect segue into our very next webinar that we have coming up on June 18th. We're going to be doing a relatively interactive webinar uh, all about how to transform your lawn from start to finish and just like this one we want you all to bring your questions and curiosity and we really want this to be an opportunity uh, to empower you by giving you the resources so that you can complete your own lawn transformation or install your gray water system to conserve those resources uh, and again be the change that you wish to see in the world and so with that, I thank you all so much for being here. And again, huge thank you to you, Laura. I really appreciate you and your wealth of knowledge. I look forward to collaborating in the future. And uh, if I haven't mentioned it enough already, we will be sending up a follow-up email with more resources and you all can absolutely reach out to Daily Axe and to Laura and check out Gray Water Action for any further resources on water conservation. We would be happy to share our skills and knowledge with you. All right, I hope you all have an excellent evening and thank you again. Bye, everybody.